Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Karolina Pepelanov, and I am Kinedoc coordinator, coordinator of the Kinedoc project. Kinedoc is an alternative distribution of the documentary films, which is run by Institute of Documentary Film and works in seven countries across Europe. So tonight we are not only streaming from Czech Republic, but also from Slovakia, Poland, Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria and Croatia. Uh, our topic tonight uh, will be a discussion about a film which we streamed yesterday. It's a Bulgarian uh, documentary film, Palace for the People. So I hope that uh, we will dig very deep into, into the architecture topic, brutalism, brutalistic architecture. And I am very happy uh, to welcome our panelists. Today we will have five great panelists and a moderator. And we will also have one of the directors of the film, uh, Boris Mesirkov. So we can, uh, we can talk about the topic uh, for in, in the next about 60 minutes, I think. Uh, please feel free to ask questions, leave your comments or your um, or anything you would like to discuss with, with our panelists in the comments below. Below the screening, we will postpone all your questions to our guests and we'll be really happy to, to, to read those comments. And now I would already like to pass my words to our moderator, to Levent Apoliak, who will be in charge of the moderation today. I hope you will enjoy the event. Have a good evening and thanks for watching. Thank you very much, Carolina, and uh, good evening to everyone here in front of the screens. Uh, I hope you're uh, ready for a great discussion. Uh, I'm really happy that uh, we're part of this, this debate because what Kinedoc is doing looks very, very interesting. And we're really happy that we can uh, actually look at architecture from the from the perspective of, of cinema and for the, for the, from, the, from the perspective of films. Uh, my name is Levent Apoliak and I'm also, uh, besides being a, a, a member of the Hungarian Contemporary Architecture Center in Budapest, I'm also founder, uh, co-founder of a, of a film festival that looks at architecture. So it's a topic that is actually very dear to me to talk about uh, cinema and architecture together. We have a great uh, set of panelists tonight. Uh, Karolina already mentioned uh, Boris Misirkov, who's the director of this movie. We have Sonia Lebos, who's an urban anthropologist from Zagreb. Peter Salai, who's an architecture historian and theoretician from the Slovak Academy of Sciences, Bratislava. Uh, Daniel Kovac, who's an art historian and curator from Budapest. Wojciech uh, Mirzidowski, I hope I pronounce it uh, well, it's going to be a challenge in the next hour, uh, from the Faculty of Architecture at the Bialystok University of Technology. So we have actually academics, researchers, professionalists uh, attacking the topic from the, from the viewpoints of architectural history or uh, cinema or images or anthropology. So we have a great set of perspectives uh, here. But I would like to start with, with the director and, and Boris, just to a little bit explore how, why did you create this movie? I hope that everybody who's joining us today uh, could watch the movie tonight. It's really worth, it's a beautiful exploration of what happens with the palaces for uh, people. And I would like to invite you, Boris, to tell us a little bit how this film was born and what is your relationship to these buildings that you showed? Hello, and thank you for having the film in the program and for inviting us to this discussion. And hello from Georgi, because there are two of us directing this film, making this film. And But usually it's me who does the talking. He does other very important things. And it was actually a project that started was started by the three of us with our producer, Marty Buziuva because we've been working together for many, many years, over 20 now. And uh, this film came, we just put together two of our areas of interest. One was the uh, closest history, nearest history and our socialist past. And the other is architecture because uh, besides of for example, me and, uh, for me and my family, my father was very interested in architecture and he was often saying that uh, architecture is the biggest of arts because it, it's supposed to remain, if not forever, for 
long time, long enough time. And so on the other hand, with Guri, we worked a lot with photographers uh, photographing architecture and uh, interior design. And we had, we made a lot of architectural friends and we learned to see the buildings, to see the, an interior with the eyes of an architect, to understand what's important of an, for an architect to see. So slowly it all came together as an idea to have the, like the quintessence, the essence of the socialist past in these, the biggest churches actually, the cathedrals of socialism. And it was a film that took us nearly seven years to make from the first idea, first versions of the script to the premiere. And of course, there was there is a lot, a lot, a lot of small stories and details that left outside of the that were left outside of the final film. And now we are thinking of a mini series of uh, small episodes for online distribution that will tell all these different stories that remained remained told. Thanks, Boris. This this sounds really uh, exciting, especially when you, uh, in the movie, you go into so many details that uh, you know for the ordinary life, the daily life of the these buildings, but uh, but also you kind of make them encounter the the overall image of these buildings. And I would like to talk a little bit about the build the image of these these buildings, the image of architecture. Uh, Sonia, I would turn to you because you are a researcher of of films and architecture. Now, what did this movie tell you? Uh, what kind of architecture did it uh, did it portray, and and what did you find maybe specific in the the cinematic language of this movie about these buildings? Uh, I saw the movie twice, so I wouldn't talk much about the cinematic uh, language of it. Um, uh, but surely, what I'm interested in in this connection between uh, film and architecture is the fact of representation. So how do we represent architecture? How do we represent space in, uh, uh, in this uh, wider notion? Also, how do we represent relations in space? And all that that is actually architecture about. It is not just about plasticity of building. Why we build architecture is because we want to inhabit it, right? So uh, what you said at the beginning of the film uh, about the palace, um, is, the re is what is relevant for the subject that I would like to address, and that is political representation. And I think that is like the axis of this movie, of this picture, of this film. And um, uh, at the beginning, it said that until the 20th century, common people were not entitled to enter a palace. So in that sense, we are looking at some sacrosanct territories open for common people in the 20th century. And then we have, of course, uh, the territories, um, so to say, um, of uh, the cities that are either in a Warsaw Pact or, or for example, uh, among uh, non-aligned countries as Yugoslavia was. And uh, these buildings are material traces of today non-existent societies countries, landscapes, also like human geographies, embedded in different kind of regimes that today in the history of the EU are mostly represented as black monolith, which I have a huge problem with so, so far. Okay, I thanks. Like Boris, you wanted to correct something, Boris. No, I saw... Uh... I'm, I'm not talking about the film. I'm saying in the history of the EU and the film, it is very well done. But in the history of EU, in the, um, let's say, uh, establishment of the EU, uh, everything what uh, uh, happened uh, behind the Iron Curtain or even in Yugoslavia that was not behind the Iron Curtain is put under uh, one black monolith, I would say. Well, maybe totalitarian hopefully, regimes. Yeah. maybe hopefully some of these buildings and and the, you know the diversity of these buildings and the diversity of their 
histories. Maybe this can uh, partly explain the diversity of what happened uh, behind the, the Iron Curtain. But you also mentioned, and this is quite interesting, that, um, um, you know, this is a quote from the film now, that palaces were until uh, recently not accessible for the common people. And these are indeed palaces for, for the common people. Now, many of them are called palaces. And still, in a way, many of them are really, uh, or could, can be seen as, as very oppressive architecture now. And I would turn to Peter, because Peter is, a, is an expert on, on totalitarian architecture. Uh, is this uh, what we see in this film? Is this what you would call totalitarian or it's absolutely not? Or what is this, this mix of, you know, in a way, democratic openness, but still kind of monumental you know, oppressiveness, uh, what we have in these buildings? Yeah, then thank, thank you, Levante, uh, and thank you for inviting me in, in this discussion. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm dealing with or I'm researching the architecture of post-war architecture in Slovakia or in Czechoslovakia, so it's connected with the totalitarian communism regime. Uh, and uh, this, I think, this film shows, yes, you already said the this variety of, of architecture styles which were used in the, this um, era and, and in this geographic era also because uh, we, we saw a high modernist or building or this brutalism architecture or social realism or kind of Gichi postmodern, <laughs> how we can call uh, the, the Bucharest Palace. Uh, but this, um, it's very difficult to, to blame architecture to be, be totalitarian. I think uh, this, um, all these regimes or, or this communist regime wanted to somehow promote themselves. And, and one of the um, way or, or way of the, the language of the architectural language is, is to make a uh, kind of monumental, uh, kind of uh, big scale uh, architecture. Uh, so, and we can see this kind of big scale architecture also in the Western country. So uh, uh, it's more, for, for my point of view, it's more uh, connected with the, with the history and memory of these places than, than with the uh, architecture itself. Or, uh, and on the other hand, when we speak about this today relationship uh, with this architecture, uh, it's paradoxically opposite than, than this uh, real uh, history connected with this building, that uh, the, the socialist realism architecture is uh, not so problematic for, for the public uh, than, than the... the modernist architecture which which were built in the time when this uh, regime wasn't so brutal it wasn't this uh, uh, stalinist regimes in in all all the, this country so it's for me it's very uh, or this, this shows kind of uh, um, perspective that that uh, not the real totalitarian history, but but more the the form or the shape of the architecture that is is problematic uh, as as kind of oppressive uh, architecture itself. Thank you, Peter. Um, let's come back to this whole topic later of of the, the diversity of styles, but. I would like to talk still a little bit about the, the image of, uh, of this post-war period. Uh, I don't know if you had this impression, but uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, there was this renaissance of, uh, of talking, or maybe even, even less ago, uh, talking about post-war architecture. A lot of Western photographers uh, rediscovered a little bit uh, you know, socialist architecture. I remember the huge book uh, of Frédéric Chauvin, the CCCP, which was... Uh, you know, in the margins of, uh, of the Soviet Union, a lot of very weird uh, modernist architectures. Now, I think a lot of German uh, photographers also rediscovered it. I think that there was this moment of fascination with, uh, with uh, such uh, architecture. Even I, uh, with some colleagues, we were trying to save some, uh, some elements of, uh, 
very futuristic architecture and turn them into something else. But to save the elements, as we, we thought it was not only in a way, you know, uh, representative of, a, of, of an age, but it was also something that this other era imagined as the future. And also these, these are fragments of idea of the future from, from our own past. But, but uh, I'm really curious of this fascination and I'm, I'm, I'm turning to Daniel because Daniel, you, you've been working a lot on understanding uh, in Hungary and beyond uh, how post-war architecture is in a way neglected and uh, ignored or even uh, looked at, down at uh, by, by the broader society. And you've been trying to change this reputation. Why do you think this bad image of uh, post-war architecture we have and how can we, how can we deal with this? Yeah, I, I was just looking at my bookshelf because I have those books that you mentioned here behind me, but then I decided not to look for them. Uh, because there was also an, an important change, I think, in the past 10 years. So like about 15 years ago, people started to discover this built heritage of the former Eastern countries. And about 10 years ago, we started to demolish them. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and this process is gaining speed, uh, in my opinion. And, and that is leading to, to various other projects about how we should deal with this kind of heritage. And I'm really grateful that you mentioned your own because that was actually one of the, the first ones in, in Hungary, uh, which was a super exciting project about how, how a building from the 80s could be re partially reused as something absolutely different. Uh, and basically what we are doing with, with, with our project in this year's Venice Biennale in the Hungarian pavilion is, is about the same. So, uh, and, and that's what I wanted to talk about a little bit because I think it, reflects to this situation quite well, that we have chosen 12 buildings from Budapest from this period, from the early 60s to the late 80s. And we have invited 12 architecture offices to basically to envision a future for these buildings. Uh, and not necessarily an architecture of future. I mean, this, this can be just a, just a, a vision, just, just an idea, just a, a, but, but it also can be a very direct reuse. And what's interesting is that these offices, these 12 offices are from the countries of the region. So only two are Hungarians and the other ones are from, from up in, in Estonia, uh, right to the south in North Macedonia. And when these architects came to Budapest and checked out these buildings, they were quite quick to, to, to realize that they all have similar buildings in their home cities. And, and that's, I, I think, super interesting because that shows that in this heritage, there is a certain potential of, of a common sense, of a common feeling for this region. And there is this ter term that is gaining popularity nowadays. It's uh, socialist modernism. And a lot of my colleagues and, and fellow researchers don't like to use it because they say it, they say it, it mixes politics with, with architecture. But I... Personally, I think it's it's the right term because there are two very important specifics for or characteristics for the architecture of this era in this region, and one is that uh, a very scarce materials were available, and very in most of the cases very primitive uh, architectural uh, building techniques. So the architects had to innovate, and they had to come up with new solutions and very strange buildings in many ways also because of the newness of the society. I, and the other thing is, is obviously common perception. So, so the common perception, the public opinion of this era is really bad <laughs> in basically all of the countries here uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. And I, I actually, and now I'm turning to the question that, that you asked, I actually personally believe that we cannot change this perception. So I think it's one of the things that we have to work with. Uh, we have to accept this and we have to figure out solutions with accepting this fact that people hate these buildings. Okay, so, so we, have, we have this um, weird contrast that uh, we have people who are born um, uh, surrounded by these buildings. They, you say they hate these buildings. Sometimes they don't notice these buildings. You know, it's part of the environment that we maybe want to get rid of or want to... Uh, get liberated off. And at the same time, there's a set of photographers and, and uh, 
maybe architects, maybe filmmakers who are coming from the West and they're fascinated by this. So there's this funny contrast. And before I see that uh, Sonia has something to say, but I, before that, I would like to come back to, to Boris a little bit. Uh, if just asking if, if how much do you think you being from uh, this region changed your, your gaze of how you deal with these buildings? Did you, were you informed by any other movies maybe done by Western uh, filmmakers? I don't like this East-West categories anyway, but now we're a little bit in this two sides of the Iron Curtain and, and hopefully we will go more into details. But Boris, how, how do you feel that your gaze onto this building, which is actually, I think more respect than, than definitely not hatred, but it's respect and also curiosity, but also a bit of a maybe melancholy sometimes. So how would you describe your, maybe your uh, relationship to these buildings? Well, it's funny that you were talking about uh, photographers working on these buildings because actually the only person we met uh, in uh, Belgrade uh, who was interested as a photographer in this building was a guy who spent a lot of time uh, somewhere in the, either in Norway or in Denmark. Then he came back and he made a big coffee table book of beautiful photographs of the building. But he was the only one of the very few who seemed to notice the beauty of this modernist architecture. Well, for us, it's, uh, it was, for us, it, I think we are in a good position to talk about these times because we know both before and after. And it was easy when we get to each uh, place to more or less quickly find the codes, how to read it, what's important there, what, how was the life going. And it was actually the most difficult palace for us but was the one in Sofia because we spent uh, like our youth there going to cinemas to film festivals we knew it inside and out and it was very hard for us to find what's uh, what's the outsider's point of view to it and of course uh, in each of these places there was some kind of melancholy for us especially when we started working on the project and in the end it was the whole film was like uh, served also as a therapy for us to stop having any melancholy for for this time. i mean we're happily done with it okay thanks boris sonia wanted to say something or object uh did you you don't uh, agree that people hate these buildings yeah, I just uh, I I don't um, support this uh, like monolith uh, uh, views. You know, like we cannot say that people in general hate. Some hate, some not. There are many movements, for example, here in the countries of Egg Yugoslavia, uh, really fighting for uh, the legacy of modernism, brutalism, and post-war architecture. Lots of people in the non-governmental sector, but also in uh, um, in in, uh, uh, in position in government and uh, some institutions work on that. So we cannot just like uh, uh, give that uh, broad. Um, statement and live with it um i mean i don't support it and considering melancholy that's really interesting but we can come to that later because you know i always see it okay why we are so afraid of melancholy what is on the opposite side capitalist schizophrenia <laughs> i mean do we want that i think capitalist hedonism is on the other side and it's in certain uh, situations it's more attractive i guess but uh, but you are absolutely right to to, to go beyond the the, the the monolithic idea and and maybe it's it's important to also uh to also clarify that when we talk here in this movie the palaces of culture we talk about a, a wide range of styles and a wide range of functions as well and i would turn to wojciech who, who uh, who's a researcher of of course of uh, post-war architecture and also looked uh, in details into brutalism and other other post-war architectural styles and i would like to ask you a little bit Maybe to explain what did we see in this film in terms of styles? Let's let's uh, get rid of this monolithic idea of these these palaces of culture. Hello, hello everybody. 
As an academic, I would like to briefly explain the differences between the architectural styles we saw in the movie. Let me uh, share the screen. I hope it's possible. It is, thank you. Do you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, fine. Uh, in my opinion, there were three uh, styles presented in the movie. Socialist realism, I would include buildings from Moscow and Bucharest to this group. Modernism, Belgrade and Berlin. And brutalism, and I have a problem with this style because only some uh, of its features were visible in building from Sofia. Uh, I'm going to show you some pictures now presenting socialist realism at first. As, as we know, it was a style introduced in the 1930s in the Soviet Union. It replaced the avant-garde styles that were developing at the time. It became the official style imposed by, by the authorities. So. In this way, it was very totalitarian style, in my opinion. After the Second World War, this style became obligatory in the countries of the Soviet bloc. Architecture was to be socialist in content and national in form. It was supposed to easily reach ordinary common people. Therefore, elements and forms well known to these people were used. They were simple historical elements taken directly from such trends as the uh, Renaissance or, uh, for instance, uh, classicism. In socialist realist buildings, we see columns, pilasters, cornices, attics, and semicircular arches. The compositions of the facades follow the principles of symmetry, axiality, and uh, regular rhythms. While these buildings were designed by well-educated architects who knew the historical principles and proportions, works of high artistic quality were built. Sometimes, however, buildings are almost pastiche and look mm, bombastic. Socialist realism in most countries of the Soviet bloc ended a few years after Stalin's death. It has survived longer here and there in the Soviet Union and for example, in Bucharest under Ceausescu. Uh, now about a uh, few words about uh, brutalism. It was a trend that began to develop in the 90s 50s, and contrary to socialist realism, it was a progressive style. Brutalism developed some ideas of modernism, but also introduced its own ideas. In my opinion, two main factors contributed to the emergence of brutalism. The first was a turning point in Le Corbusier's work, and the second factor was the architectural theory created by Allison and Peter Smithson and called the New Brutalism. Le Corbusier turned to vernacular uh, architecture with its simple forms and natural materials as early in the 1930s. He began to emphasize uh, that the role of a building is to evoke emotions he decided to create sensual and expressive buildings. He completely undermined the primacy of the machine aesthetic. He rejected white cubic buildings for the benefit of sculptural heavy forms, as it can be seen in Unit d'Habitation and other of his post-war buildings. The second uh, factor was the new brutalism theory. In harsh post-war conditions, young English architects decided to look for architecture corresponding to the real situation. 
an objective perception of reality became their main assumption. Architecture was to result from everyday life. Thanks to this, ordinary people should identify with brutalist buildings more than with abstract forms of the international style. The new brutalists were inspired by uh, avant-garde uh, art trends. The basis of uh, these trends was the rejection of aerial principles of composition and the use of objects, materials, or sounds as found. As found means in raw form without any treatment. These uh, ideas were adap adapted by creators of the new brutalism and by brutalists later and applied in their architectural design. The first examples of the new brutalism were buildings with simplified forms constructed from ordinary, easily available materials, untreated and uh, uncovered. The buildings that I show presented the most important features of the brutalist style, including massiveness, articulation of internal uh, functions in facades, exposed, exposed concrete, uh, three-dimensional uh, facades. You can see also uh, elements and details characteristic of brutalism, sunbreakers, cantilevered solids, service towers, heavy set pillars, and so on. Brutalist uh, architecture originated in the West, that's a fact, uh, and it mainly developed there. However, uh, brutalism also reached the countries of the Soviet bloc, albeit with some delay. Here I am showing examples from former Yugoslavia, uh, that, that was Skopje, Poland, Slovakia, and uh, Lithuania. The building in uh, Bulgaria and Sofia that we saw in the film also has some brutalist uh, features. And the last style uh, is classicist modernism. Uh, an example of this uh, style was the Belgrade Federation Palace presented in the film. It was a combination of the modernist style and the principles of classical architecture. Therefore, in the form of a building, you can see symmetry, proportions of golden ratio, regular rhythms, or uh, pseudo colonnades. That's, that's all, sorry for those too long explanations. Well, thanks a lot. Now we have an image of all the diversity of also what we saw. Uh, probably there, it would be needed maybe to certain kind of audience also to diversify what happened be, behind the iron curtain but this is not our role here but i would like to move a little bit on to to another question that what happens with these buildings in, in a broader context um i would go like to go back to peter because you uh, you are researching modern urbanism on a on a, also in the urban scale now you also I studied, uh, I think, uh, Bratislava, new uh, urban plans. And some of the buildings we see uh, in the film, they are very integrated parts of, uh, of a broader urban plan. No? We see in the, in, the, in the movie, the Belgrade Palace uh, is conceived as a kind of the, the gate to, the, to Novi Belgrade, the, the new district of Belgrade. Uh, but what happens with these buildings when, um, when the context changes completely now? So in a way, this very often these modern uh, buildings, they, they, you know, they compose as part of a, a larger composition, a divine order, but this order doesn't stay as it is now. So what happens when the context changes? What, how do these buildings, in a way, find their new relationship with the, with the neighborhoods? Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I think... Um... Yeah, I studied Bratislava, where, where there are some other other problems, or or that they they wanted to rebuild the center and and uh, bring a new perspective to to the to kind of traditional structure and then bring this uh, modernist open space and and uh, a ten charter. <laughs> Uh, principles uh, with with the uh, air and green and, and 
and uh, abolishing of the of the traditional structure of the city. So, but but um, after the eighty nine on on or or in the time of postmodern, we can say because this this happened also to to the architecture in, in the Western uh, uh, this modern architecture or postwar modernism. So. There, there were effort to to bring back this traditional structure to to uh, make um, denser <laughs> uh, a denser structure of the city, and, and uh, mostly also uh, connected with this capitalist thinking or, or thinking to to uh, use use the the open space uh, or monetize the open space. Uh, so, so mostly there is an effort to to either um, bring a new new structure to 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 the the surroundings of the of the building, or or mostly to pull down these buildings because uh, it's difficult to to uh, make kind of. Uh, uh, structure uh, which fit uh, to now nowadays uh, ideas of the of the city uh, and left let the the these monuments uh, this this building which were meant as kind of jewels uh, in the structure of the city yeah. they, they wanted to be kind of these palaces <laughs> which show 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 the power or or Show the power of the nation or, or the peoples. So, so uh, this is kind of problem. Yeah, yeah. Of, I think it's these places. Yeah, I think it's very true that that uh, you mentioned that these are like jewels. Uh, so it's it's very easy to relate to a specific building, but it's much more difficult to relate to a broader urban environment. Now, which, which, uh, for example. Um, yeah, there's some really good modern centers. Now you go to Rotterdam, probably the, what was there before the war, probably it was even better, but there's a quite good scale, very livable modern center uh, for Rotterdam. Also, for example, Daniel, uh, I think some of your, uh, your projects or your focus is also on, on some modern centers of, of Hungarian towns. For example, Kellenfeld, I went to a, a walk organized by your Venice Biennale Pavilion. How do we? How can we relate to you know broader structures that are not one building, but something broader that maybe needs a different kind of knowledge or, or, or relationship or perception from the from the side of the broader public? I think if we are talking about uh, like um, an urban ensemble, then then it's a lot easier to understand and to appreciate. Uh, it's it's aesthetical and historical qualities than if we are talking about, for example, a new block in a in an anyway traditional uh, urban city center. And in this sense, uh, also uh, the uh, context of the society matters. So so in a way, I would I would indeed rephrase what I said uh, earlier and agree with Sonia that in certain societies in the region, uh, it's a the, this recent past means uh, a lot different than in other societies. And it, it's actually a, a very good example. One of the participants of, of our project in the Venice Biennale, um, it, it's, a, uh, it's an architectural office called Contra, which, is, uh, which was founded by a Slovenian and two North Macedonian architects, and it's based in Zagreb. And they basically, they, they founded this idea on the uh, idea of, of post-Yugoslavia. So they basically talk about themselves as a post-Yugoslavian office. And the fact that this identity still exists proves that this architecture can indeed survive and that there are people who appreciate it. In Hungary, however, I think the, the situation is a little different. Uh, also in Romania, probably, where, where, where this, this kind of architecture represents and, and represents a totalitarian regime, basically, and just that. Um, but yes, going back to the question, I, I think, like, for example, uh, you have seen in the movie that from the five buildings that was chosen by Boris, one was already demolished. And from the 12 buildings that we have chosen two years ago, two were demolished in the past one year. So... Uh, 
to a general applause, I have to say. So basically, there were some some uh, uh, re uh, repercussions from from the side of the architects, but the general public was just amazed by that they are gone. Uh, and yes, one was in in the Buddha Castle, so in, in the in a in a historical uh, city center, and I have to say, most of the people are happy to see it gone. Yeah, this is a, this is a very very important topic, and maybe in the remaining time, I would like to focus on this exactly preservation uh, or demolition or or the afterlives of, of buildings. No, Boris, I, I found it fascinating in the movie that, uh, for example. When you go into the Sofia building, you also said that this is the building you know the most. So it was difficult to find, uh, uh, you know, a, a specific channel to the building or a specific angle to the building because you know it so well. But still, you find something that I find quite amazing: this this uh, this moment of uh, of uh, the engineer or, or, or the the person who's maintaining the building. On the one hand, they 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 say that. Uh, the building now is hosting all kinds of events. Uh, it has to produce a bit of uh, profits, or at least a little bit. So this is, the, the, I think, the only building that we we heard about uh, how it's working today in terms of survival and economy, but also a lot of little elements uh, that are, you know, technical elements. Uh, I think the bulbs or certain certain parts of the. The building, the engineering part of the building, that are no longer produced because the companies that were producing them went bankrupt. So some people are there to repair them manually because they still want this to to work together. So I'm really curious. How did? What was your impression of of uh, of how these these buildings change their use? And and what was your feeling? What was because of course you want to tell these buildings in the past and and in the present and maybe in the future, but. You, you arrived in a specific moment when, in a way, some of in some of these cases, it's a suspended state. No, it's definitely not as they were designed. There, these buildings are often looking for a new use. We saw that, uh, I, you know, in, in Bucharest, they try to squeeze in everything possible because it's so big. This building. So, how did you how did you look at the the, to, the the present day of these buildings? How did you? Because of course you didn't have much time either to tell all that you saw there. So what was your approach to tell the present, the contemporary moment of these buildings, Boris? You're muted. Yeah. It was very interesting for us when we went on the initial research to see how different each of these buildings is, not only in terms of architecture, but in terms of the way people see it and the way people want to use it. And it really reflects uh, some national, <clears throat> the national character. Like in Moscow, they don't change anything and they don't want to change anything. It just fits perfectly in the Russian idea of you know, some kind of good academic living. Uh, well, in uh, Germany, it's fell as a fell victim actually to the unification of the two Germanys. It had to be a symbolical sign or demolition of the Palace de la Republique was a symbolic sign by the East Germany saying like, okay, we're ready to get rid of our socialist past. And in Bulgaria, actually, it was the most, maybe for us, it was the most functional building because actually it worked very well as a concert scene in the 80s. And they had a deal even while they were constructing the building, they already made a deal with uh, Sony Music to make recordings of Russian operas there because we had a very good orchestra and a choir that was capable of performing operas that most Western singers couldn't do. So they had a huge contract and they recorded, I think, at least a dozen of operas and many concerts. But nowadays uh, in Bulgaria, we're, because we're very good not at intentionally destroying something, just not caring about any kind of style or period pieces. So actually in uh, Bulgaria, we were lucky to shoot in the last moment 
before they started the complete renovation of the palace for the Bulgarian presidency of the EU. So all the beautiful clocks are gone. All the half of the house are filled with these stupid fake roofs, fake ceilings that make them twice lower. And it's uh, basically the few visual elements and the little bit of style it had, it's totally fucked up now. Okay, so they brusselified the, the building. Yeah, so it's very much, you really see the national character in each building. Like in Belgrade there, I absolutely admire the, the way they preserve every detail in this, in this place. Okay, thank you, Boris. I also wanted to move to Sonia, and also she wants to say something, but because also, Sonia, you mentioned before that, uh, that in Croatia there's a, there are movements to preserve buildings, so it's the, the public is not so, let's say, um, indifferent. So the, you can mobilize people, and, and I'm really curious is what what is behind, and I'm especially curious what is the what is the process to get get there, because I also saw similar things in in Poland, in Warsaw, especially. Uh, and I'll ask Wojtek about this, but I don't see, for example, big movements in, in, in Hungary to save uh, modernist buildings, little professional gatherings, uh, you know, some discussions, but definitely not, not a lot of people uniting to protect some buildings. How is it in Croatia, Sonia? Um, well, it's very difficult because we also have, uh, I live in Zagreb, as you know, it suffered uh, uh, an earthquake, a big one, and then a series of uh, smaller ones. So uh, we are facing uh, neglect in this technical terms, and this neglect has been going on for a very long time, also back to the socialist times. But in the socialist times, we had urbanism. And in the last 30 years, we just haven't had any. It was urbanism. destroyed. Urbanism, yes, yeah. urbanism. It was destroyed. So planning of space and also the social planning that goes with it has been completely destroyed. Of course, that uh, mass movement, as you say, uh, in, in the terms of uh, protecting uh, buildings from uh, the times of socialism and post-war architecture, that it doesn't exist. Yes, it uh, it is. Uh, it can be reduced to um, um, like. Uh, um, let's say tryouts of professionals and people who uh, understand uh, how important it is to protect urbanism as discipline and also the legacy of urbanism in Yugoslavia. I would also like to add to what Boris said about um, uh, the Belgrade uh, uh, Palace. Uh, yes, uh, it is preserved, but the memory is shifted. In uh, the simple example, uh, what uh, used to be a uh, space um, denominated according to a specific republic, because there were six republic um, comprising a federation. Now it's just like a blue room or, you know, a brown room. So um, the whole notion of federation, of brotherhood and unity, of the possibility of different nations to live together in peace, maybe not in harmony, but in peace and tolerance is erased with it. So uh, we have like a shell that is fantastic. It's a uh, divine example of total design, but the memory has been twisted and depoliticized in the sense. And I completely relate to what Daniel said. It is different in Yugoslavia. That was non-aligned country. And it is different behind the Iron Curtain. I was a student in Prague in 87. I remember clearly how people were eager to leave, you know, these uh, 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 mm, curtain, yeah, to, 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 to penetrate it, to go uh, above it, to go through it. So, uh, but now when you have this uh, experience of a living in, uh, uh, in a quite deregulated uh, spaces all across Europe, when we have imposed uh, a totally different uh, a notion of regulations of space and our lives, mm -hmm. I think that we have to look uh, back to some things, you know, and rethink what totalitarian is about, including, you know, the organization of space. We cannot put under the same um, um, monolith, monolith uh, view, 
for example, uh, the terrible, the, the, the horrid example of Bucharest, right, and Ceausescu regime, or, you know, Sofia, that is, uh, I think, uh, um, something that we have to relate to in, the, in different terms, you know, there were, there, there were attempts to, to live the culture, you know, within this uh, uh, false communism, I would say. And also this fantastic example of a Berlin Palast. <laughs> I would just like to hear from Boris, you know, what about this process of fight for it? Because, you know, this very specific uh, typology that you have parliament and the theater, this fantastic theater on the other side, you know, that, you know, you, you could put Boris Wilson there. You could, I don't know, have uh, Ashton de Neubauten playing there. You, can, you could have thousands of things, you know, and what they, they did, you know, they would put, for example, in those socialist times, they would put uh, cabaret kitsch uh, and so on. So it is so, so, so painful that it is destroyed, you know? It was great space. So I would, uh, um, if there, we can come to that topic uh, about uh, uh, the fight for that space and how it was lost, I think that would be fantastic. Maybe not this time, but sometimes. I mean, it's, it's really important. And also that, you know, of course, Germans as they are, they have every piece of it somewhere, you know, kind of uh, put aside. So the reconstruction is possible. We saw how in, in the movie how some of the utensils now and the cups are circulating in the city. They go into into the the, the secondhand shops and on antiquariat. So that's yeah. actually quite quite beautiful how it, they come back and they are appreciated by 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 a lot of people. But and I if would... I can if, if I can add just one more thing, you know, also this Palace of the Republic, you know, it showed the life of the German people. East, East German people that we didn't know. So it wasn't all gray and monotonous. They also had fun. They had teenage disco. You know, they had some kind of luxury involved in this pride of monumentality. So, um, you know, I'm just trying to oppose, you know, putting all these um, complex notions of life you know, under the monolith of totalitarian, of course, you know, that some things were horrid. But come on, people, you know, there were horrid things happening in the US at the time as well. Rosenbergs were put on the electric chair and burnt, you know, so uh, we have to think, rethink the world, you know, and rethink the history in, and uh, I think in, uh, uh, in this uh, terms of, you know, how to organize globally, because these are the times. No, no, I, I absolutely agree that, that uh, I mean, of course, all, the image, all, all, the, all, all these buildings, in a way, incorporated a lot of different things. And, and also, I think the movie shows exactly well the, this diversity. Uh, and also, it's, it's quite interesting how you, for example, mentioned luxury and the feeling of luxury that is, that is maybe not that kind of luxury that is, a, that is an individual uh, wealth, but it's something like, uh, you know, something that we collectively can afford, you know, in, in the movie we see that uh, the Palace de la Republic was the, uh, I guess, the, the, the most expensive uh, yeah. building of the GDR, not to mention, yeah. of course, the Bucharest building, which was definitely the most expensive yeah. building of the... Yeah, they destroyed the, the country uh, to build it, but uh, I think this exactly. is this horrid part, yeah, Bucharest is this horrid part of, yeah. you know, and I think this is false communism. They re reinstalled their power. They wanted, you know, the power of, uh, an, uh, of uh, he wanted, they wanted the power of emperors. So they yeah. reinstalled the system that had nothing to do with communism. I mean, according to its definition, they did quite the opposite. They ruined the people, they ruined the economy just to make the mausoleum, 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 mausoleum for themselves. You know, so it's, it's totally different. So it's, um, I think we also have to rethink that. It's a, yes. Just I, like I, uh, Haile Selassie this. in Ethiopia or, you know, this new kind of emperorship. And That's I, what I, they I'm were I'm doing. I'm afraid it's not the last time it happened in Europe. Uh, so Oof. We, we, let's we let's prevent watch out. it. Let's we, we prevent better it. Watch out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I would like to, because we are closing to the, the closure, but I would like to speak more uh, about Poland as well, because my, my experience of, for example, Warsaw, I thought, I, th I think maybe about 10 years ago, there was a moment when, when in, in, in Warsaw, uh, an architecture office called Centrala did, uh, I think, something really interesting. They started repositioning modernist architecture pieces around 
the railway station. And th there was this the main main railway station, and they re renovated the kiosk. It's something that they also played with the graphics and all kinds of you know all the image of of these buildings in order to make them attractive and even hype and trendy. And I have a T-shirt which I don't have on on me, but I got it from a, a, a Polish NGO. There was uh, a, a game with the typography of the, the, the main, main station of Warsaw as a, as a kind of a tribute to modernism. So there was this moment of rediscovery and you know, not rediscovery by, by travelers or by an exotic gaze, but rediscovery by, by the inhabitants themselves. So I'm, I'm really curious uh, how Wojtek you, you're seeing this process, and of course, Warsaw is, is not like other cities in, in Poland. Warsaw was, of course, it, 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 it's an important part of its legacy and heritage is modernist and post-war because of the, the horrible demolitions and or destructions in the, uh, in the war. But I guess it's, I'm, I'm really curious how it played out in other places in, in Poland. And also how, how do you see this, uh, is, is there a, uh, a recognition of modernist architecture? Are there efforts to preserve these jewels of modernist architecture, or it's uh, it's uh, it's more conservative than uh, than that? Before I, I go to the core of your question, I would like you uh, I would like to distinguish uh, several ways of devaluation of these noticeable buildings because it's hard to. To, to generalize. I would like to tell you about uh, some uh, ways from relatively mild to the totally devastating. For instance, in Krakow, we, we have uh, a lot of brutalist buildings. I'm specialized in, in this style, so it is the, the closest topic uh, for me. And there is a very uh, huge, but with very good architecture uh, hotel, uh, forum hotel, uh, which uh, has become the biggest advertising board in Poland. Huge billboards cover its entire uh, facades. Uh, the, this building exists, but uh, we don't know anything about its, about its original form. The second uh, way, uh, uh, buildings which were uh, closing major view access, access uh, or were clearly exposed in the urban uh, landscape have been recently hidden behind new structures, often presenting much lower architectural values. Uh, the third, the rebuilding often changes and distorts the original form of the building sometimes relative, relatively small changes, such as uh, replacement of uh, windows or plastering the concrete surfaces affect the whole character of architecture. Uh, often the final step before the demolition of the building it, uh, is its negligence leading to ruin. And the fifth, the worst way of devaluation is uh, demolition. And that, and I'm coming back to your question. Several years ago in Katowice, the perfect example of Polish brutalism, the railway station uh, built in, in early uh, 1970s was demolished. Despite many protests of architects and historians and ordinary uh, people. After some time, fragments of the uh, shell structure of this uh, building were rebuilt and put into the form of a new shopping center, but it is completely new building. I'm not a building preservation specialist. However, I think that the biggest problem in protecting, uh, prote protecting such buildings is money. These buildings are not uh, adapted to modern standards, most of them. For, it, for example, when it comes to thermal insulation, the renovation and especially uh, reconstruction is difficult and very expensive. I'm not talking about this uh, magnificent palaces. I'm talking about uh, smaller ordinary uh, buildings. They are they are treated by demolitions. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Wojtek. I would uh, ask the same thing from, from Peter. Uh, I think you're also a member of Docomomo, so you actually, professionally, you work with uh, saving some of the modern masterpieces. How, how are things in, uh, in Slovakia about this? Yeah, I think that uh, very similar as in Croatia, Hungary and, and Poland, yeah, in our countries. Uh, but I feel that the, there are people uh, and movements who, who are trying to protect this building who are amusing, this architecture, and, and um, there are a lot of books published, uh, which are kind of popular <laughs> books with nice pictures or, or, or drawings. Uh, but there is also this kind of opposition and it, I feel that it starts kind of cultural war, war also uh, between this, <laughs> this topic or this, this protection of, of this building that uh, some other tell us, yes, this is, <laughs> you are some Stalinist who want to protect and bring back the totalitarian regime of communism and um, the developer use this this uh, rhetorics or, or this tension of, of the society and uh, one of the example is in Bratislava and I and now the uh, former house of the unions which was kind of this kind of cultural palace or, or congress palace and uh, the developer who bought it from from unions uh, long ago uh, want to uh, mm, pull it down uh, because they want to build their uh, congress center <laughs> because the state uh, um, and kind of competition for developers who will they will grant some money to to build a congress center in Bratislava. So they didn't want to reconstruct or somehow reuse this building, but they want to uh, pull it down <laughs> because uh, they can maybe uh, use the space uh, for for much money. <laughs> when they pull it down, then else they will restore or somehow reuse only the parts of the, these buildings. Thank you, Peter. It's interesting that you mentioned culture war because, because uh, I think we're all facing this uh, similar kind of culture war. But maybe one way of, of uh, getting this out of a, a culture war is to give a new function, no? so not, not leave it to represent something, but also to, you know, rethink buildings, what they can accommodate. And uh, this brings me back to, to Budapest and to, to Daniel, who with your Venice Biennale project, you are actually looking for new uses as well, right? So redesigning or what to do with the, not redesigning, but, you know, reusing or, or you know, adopting the buildings for, for contemporary uses. Do you think this can be the way to protect some of these buildings? Or as you mentioned already, two buildings of your selection have been demolished in the last years. It's not enough. Uh, are there are, are these buildings that you, you you're dealing with? Are they capable of, uh, you know, accommodating new functions? Well, <clears throat> some of them are obviously yes, but what I mean the the realization that I came to in this process is that um, we always talk about how things should be and could be and things that should be done, and we we just forgot to talk about how things are and face with how things are because because things uh, because in my opinion if you think about the movie all the buildings featured in the movie are preserved in a way or another one of them Except was for berlin yeah well. that was obviously that was demolished but it is still preserved yeah. in some of the materials some of the chairs are reused and in people's memories the building lives along. I mean, I think it's quite beautiful when, when people remember a building and, you know, the scene when, when the former uh, waiters and the former ser uh, servers of the building gather together and uh, celebrated this community, which, which was itself a rem remembers, uh, sorry, a remembrance of the building. And other, th there are other buildings that still serve their original purpose quite nicely and quite fine. And, and uh, uh, 
but there is, for example, the, the Opera House in Sofia, which lost its urban context. There is a beautiful archive footage in the movie which shows the monument that stood next to it, which was demolished a couple of years ago, right, in Sofia. So I, I think what we have to accept is that there is, no, there is no certain and direct way for these buildings to survive. So there will be, and there are various ways and various levels in which such a building uh, as part of, of, of the collective memory of, uh, of the society can survive. And in, in this sense, I would refer to, um, to a Spanish writer, Jorge Otero Pailas. He wrote a really good book about experimental preservation. And uh, in this, he talks about how mm, it is important or it would be really important to uh, preserve the architectural idea behind the building and not necessarily the building itself, not necessarily the, the materials or the architectural solutions, but to try to discover what can survive and what can be useful for today's, to, for today's society and for the future, which is not necessarily the materials and the spatial solutions. And I actually, I really like this idea. And uh, I think we should think more about this and in, in, here in this region because, because the fate of this heritage is going to be more and more problematic in, in the near future. That's, I'm sure of. Thank you, Daniel. I, I, I was hoping that you will not come up with something as provocative. So we restart the whole conversation as we have to close. But Peter, just two sentences, if you want, I will give you back and then we will have to unfortunately yeah, yes. close. Sorry, I just uh, want to add that uh, also uh, not the ideas are necessary, but facing environmental crisis, we have to rethink to um, some, somehow protect or use all what was already built and not built new, but, but to find how to use the new, not produce more uh, oxygen. <laughs> and then, uh, so, so we... This is also what, what we can to think, not, not only these cultural things, but, but also uh, purely practical uh, question of, of protecting architecture. Yes, thank you very much. So uh, thing, you know, those resources that seemed infinite, well, we learned from the movie that they were never infinite. Uh, they're absolutely not infinite and nobody feels that they are infinite today. So we definitely have a very different approach to these buildings. Uh, than uh, when they were built uh, a few decades ago. I'm afraid that we will have to close. I, will, I would have so many more questions to you. Uh, I really appreciate that you, you took part in this discussion. Um, a lot of very good insights and a lot of very interesting perspectives. Uh, so I would like to thank you very much, uh, Boris, for the movie and for your participation. I hope we can see your, uh, the, the shorter episodes as well soon somewhere on screen and also as I'm a, an organizer of a film festival I hope we'll be in touch uh, in the future as well. Sonia thank you very much and thank you for uh, also pointing out that we have to diversify this idea behind the Iron Curtain because this is something we or some people often forget. Peter thank you very much for your contributions. Wojciech uh, thanks and, and also for clarifying our ideas of uh, post-war architectural styles, and Daniel for uh, provoking a little bit. Uh, thank you very much. And Kinedoc, I hope uh, you will bring us similarly nice movies in the future. Thank you very much uh, for our audience and hope we will continue this discussion someday, somewhere. Have a nice evening, you all. Thank you, goodbye.